Now, to introduce a bit more about where we are coming from this session. So I'm from the Rescope Project. Uh, we're a non-profit organisation founded by the late Professor Frank Fisher, who was Australia's inaugural Environmental Educator of the Year back in 2007, in acknowledgement of decades of work, decades of pioneering work in systems thinking and sustainability education. Now, we're, what we're trying to do, we're set up to empower people to regenerate the systems and stories we live by, is how we're talking about it. So that incorporates the cultural narratives of progress, for example, but also how we understand the world, the stories we tell about our place in the world. And then the systems that we not only uh, or go, go ahead then upon how we understand the world, the systems that we organise ourselves by, from political to economic to food, transport, anything, but also the way we can understand reality in systemic terms. And we've heard that, thankfully, a bit today about how we can go from the more linear reductionist understandings that we've had over the journey, over the last few hundred years anyway, in Western culture, and into uh, more systemic understandings of reality. So we might cover more of um, cover off more on those things today too. That's, that's the Rescope Project's field of inquiry. And we're particularly looking to take that inquiry to a very public level. So where we have uh, done a lot of work in the university space and in conferences like this, we're looking to take it very public, very national in the Australian case, and see if we can't make this sort of dialogue we're gonna have today much more commonplace. We think, we think if you can trigger that sort of thing, the answers that naturally come out of questions about what's most important to us will catch a light and we'll see a lot more constructive and depolarised dialogue and action. So today, we do share a powerful and necessary dialogue on how we transition from the consumer city to the eco city. We're interested in what's needed or indeed what is happening currently to redefine progress and transition to an economy based on quality and not quantity. From the big picture macro level to the personal level and certainly the community level in between that. Now each person on this stage has such a wealth of knowledge and on the ground experience. I, I'm really happy that I didn't actually, the, the panel came together the way it did and that I couldn't have been happier to have seen who was on this uh, table with me today. So I'm really looking forward to the session and we've got a terrific turnout so clearly you are too. It's such an important session. There's so much positive work being talked about at this summit, yet there's a feeling that certainly myself and a few others have that we're still missing that critical substrate that it, it builds upon. All this good stuff can build upon or slot into, but where is that? Where does it fit in terms of the bigger picture transition we're after and that we need? So what do we do? To actually make the shifts we're after for what is most important in life, how do we go about it? Today we're going to have a format whereby we run five minute fire starters each. So the four of us are going to tee off for five minutes and then we'll have the rest of the session to go into dialogue and we'll have there are mics there for you guys to get involved with and ask questions. So to kick off, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce the gentleman at the far end there. Dr. Jose Ramos is a social change researcher transdisciplinary collaborator and advocate for commons-oriented social alternatives. His focus is on supporting breakthrough design and social innovation through his practices Action Foresight, Action, Action Foresight and Futures Lab, and in leading and supporting a wide number of high-impact so social change projects. He's originally from California, from Mexican-American heritage, now living in Melbourne, Australia with his young family. Please give a warm welcome to Jose Ramos. Oh, Jose, before you kick off, and while you're teeing up your presentation, Sharon is also going to uh, present with Jose from the Commons Transition Coalition. So Sharon will immediately follow Jose with her five minutes. So let me introduce her too while we're at it. Sharon Ede is an urbanist and activist working to build the sharing and collaborative movement in Australia and beyond. She is founder of Audacities, a catalyst to relocalise production in cities and has a long involvement with the ecological city movement. For five years in the 1990s, she was a full-time volunteer for Urban Ecology Australia, the community organisation that initiated the Halifax Eco City Project, and later Adelaide's international award-winning piece of Eco City, Christy Walk. Sharon was selected as a Sharing Cities Fellow by US-based Shareable 
and contributed to a book due for release in 2017 called Sharing Cities, Activating the Urban Commons. She recently produced a well-received paper called The Real Circular Economy, which made the case that the circular economy of materials is necessary but insufficient and called for our linear extractive economy to also become circular. I'll get you to welcome Sharon when she comes to the stage. But please again, welcome Thanks. Jose Ramos and we can get started. Thanks. Jose. Okay, so because we're doing uh, fire starters, I got five minutes, I really have enough time to introduce one idea, basically. And that idea is the idea of design global, manufacture local. Um, I call it Cosmo localization. So uh, apologies for those who already know the idea. You're not going to really understand, get anything new. Um, this is for those people that haven't heard this before. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to go through just a couple of different um, uh, examples. So this is um, a picture from FarmHack in the United States. And what FarmHack does is um, they essentially bring together farmers um, to build their own farm tools. So they have shared platforms, shared digital platforms, in which um, people can put ideas forward and, uh, and even put more detailed designs. And then they'll convene sessions like this, and they'll actually work through the details on those different farm tools, and, uh, and they'll prototype them. And when they're, when, they've done, when, they're, when they're done prototyping them, then they'll upload them uh, back to the digital platforms, and those will be available for any farmer around the world to use. Uh, here's a, um, I don't know what this is called, but um, uh, I'm not a farmer, and uh, yeah. My, it's my partner who likes to do all the gardening, and I just, um, I like to watch and eat the, eat, eat the labor at the end. Um, but um, there's, a, there's a good example of um, people basically working through a, uh, a farm uh, machine and um, testing it out. Here's another group. This is a French group called Le Atelier Paysans, uh, which I think means the Peasants' Workshop. And they do something very similar. They uh, essentially bring together farmers to uh, work through how to build the tools. They're, they're, they're a network of organic farmers, and they come together to, to build the tools that they need to do organic farming. Uh, and from my understanding of what they do, their, their needs are actually quite different to uh, the industrial scale farming needs. So um, if they want to solve a lot of their problems and if they go to, let's say, um, a farm equipment retailer, that farm equ equipment retailer is not necessarily going to be geared towards their problems and their needs. So, so they really sort of came together to begin um, working through some of the challenges and the problems that they had. And they do something very similar. Um, they come together in workshops. They work together to prototype the tools that they need to mutually use. And then again, they uh, make them openly accessible to any farmer around the world who wants to use that design. Um, now, FarmHack and uh, L'Atelier Paysans are a little bit different. FarmHack is a little bit more um, of an open network, whereas uh, L'Atelier Paysans um, gets government support, and it uh, literally has um, one or two trucks that go around the country running um, workshops in different uh, parts of France. And uh, there's another picture from uh, L'Atelier Paysans of people working through. Um, this, is, um, this is a Sydney-based enterprise uh, called AbilityMate. And uh, what they do is they <coughs> uh, take 3D, uh, they take um, designs for assistive devices for people with disabilities. And they, they 3D print them in support of people uh, who um, have those particular needs. And so um, they're, they're an incredibly exciting, innovative um, uh, organization. There's an example of uh, a 3D printed device that comes from. So again, they're also straddling this idea of 
drawing upon the emerging, well, the term that I like to use is global design commons. We, we know the idea of a, of a knowledge commons or a global knowledge commons, Wikipedia, that sort of thing. So in terms of actually manufactured products, we can think of it as a, as a global design commons, that there's designs around the world that accumulate in pools or platforms that people can actually use to, um, uh, to manufacture things at a local level. And this is a, um, a picture of an underwater drone. And um, this is my son with the, uh, one of the founders, um, Eric. Um, this is a company in Berkeley, California called OpenRove. And they also use sort of an open source design approach uh, to their local manufacturing. So really briefly, um, what do these all have in common? So these are some gross distinctions to kind of sort of help orient us. So traditional manufacturing, the IP is held by one company. It's produced by the company with national global supply chains, and it's shipped nationally or globally. So glo uh, design global manufacturer local inverts this logic. So intellectual property is open and globally distributed. Any group can use it. Production and supply, it's produced by any group that requires goods, and it's preferably around local supply chains. And um, the distribution, well, it's used by local groups or community. So it's a very different production model. It's just emerging. So when I talk about this, it's very similar to, um, to um, uh, William Gibson's idea that the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed that basically this is something very new. It's, it's really in the realm of people here who know futures and foresight. It's an emerging issue. So just to um, close, uh, this is the basic idea that at a global scale, we have open and globally distributed designs, design pools and platforms. And then they potentiate local scale production. The producer communities involved are involved in peer production. And then as those local communities produce things, that then becomes a resource, again, for people around the world. So it's, it's, it's that sort of virtuous logic of production that we're talking about. So with that, um, I'll hand over to Sharon. Please give a warm welcome to Sharon Eden. Thanks to Jose Ramos. So we're going forwards that way? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for choosing this session. Um, my presentation follows on very much in the same theme as Jose's, which is why we're sort of co-presenting there. So there's two big meta trends I see happening in the world today. One's just been articulated very well by Jose, which is that we now have digital technology and the open source movement lowering the financial and the practical barriers to production. In other words, the physical means of production is being democratised. And of course, the other meta trend is why we're all here today. It's about cities that are becoming, well, are and becoming even more so the economic and political powerhouses of this century. And by 2025, research shows that only 600 cities will generate more than half of global GDP growth. That's an image of uh, Shenzhen, China. However, to sustain this growth, <coughs> cities are running ecological deficits. They're dependent on on this fossil fuel based supply lines that bring things, you know, that uh, appropriate ecological resources from elsewhere. And so effectively, cities aren't just where they are physically. And that's something to really, really consider when we're talking about cities, ecological cities. It's not just the buildings, the transportation systems, what's in the city itself, it's where the city is drawing on other environments and other communities, other commons, in order to sustain the inhabitants of that city and how we live. So at the time of the Rio Earth Summit, there was an estimate that 75% of the natural resources that are harvested and mined from the Earth are shipped, trucked, railroaded and flown to the 2.5% of the Earth's surface that is metropolitan. And at that point, 80% of those resources are converted into waste. And if you're wondering what that is, that is a shipping ship, shipping, shipping ships. So it's all going <laughs> to... Try saying that six times fast. So it's, okay. it's all gone a bit meta. If we're doing this kind of thing, it sort of suggests we're moving a heck of a lot of stuff all over the planet. Shipping's projected to be responsible for 17% of global emissions by 2050. Um, this is kind of concerning because shipping and aviation are excluded from the international climate change negotiations because 
it's difficult apparently to allocate emissions to one country. If they'd actually spoken to Global Footprint Network, who do the ecological footprint and maintain data sets for 200 odd countries, they could actually find out that you can actually um, disaggregate you know, the impacts of uh, production, consumption, import and export. You can actually do that, but apparently we don't want to. <laughs> then we get these very strange situations. These are two true stories. Uh, one is a um, story reported a couple of years back that prawns that were being caught in Scotland were sent to Thailand for shelling, then sent shipped back to the UK. So that's because the Thai labour is cheaper, which is a 13,000 mile round trip. And that second one was some research reported in natural capitalism. I think it was the Wuppertal Institute that did this research. Strawberry yoga in Germany, clocking up 12,000 miles of transport in the process of being made. So these are kind of really, really bizarre uses of fossil fuels, which are only possible because we've got cheap fossil fuels. Then we get into the really crazy stuff of boomerang trade. The New Economics Foundation did a report on this a few years back. There was all these like goods going backwards and forwards across the planet. Potatoes, toilet paper, everything, you name it. Uh, it prompted one economist who was contemplating the export of uh, sugar cookies to Denmark while importing sugar, sugar cookies from Denmark to say, wouldn't it be more efficient to just swap recipes? And that's the point of the, the global design commons. That's the recipes. So what if we swapped information, recipes or designs, rather than the product itself? So there's this idea of cosmolocalization, design global, manufacture local, where the economy of bits, the light things, that's the data, the information, the shared open source design, that's what travels. The local stuff, the heavy stuff stays local. The economy of atoms, the heavy stuff, that stays local. We have emerging uh, uh, sites like makerspaces and fab labs. These are physical spaces, equipment and networks. You can relocalise production. So if we harness these spaces plus the digital manufacturing technologies, we can return production to cities in a different way, not in centralised you know, 19th and 20th century industry, but micro factories, distributed manufacturing. We can do cleaner production. It can be customised. It can be done on demand. There are over a thousand fab labs in the world today. That's just one brand of, of makerspace that's come out of a program at MIT, uh, fabrication laboratories. And they re represent a potential distributed infrastructure for relocalizing production. So the idea, and this is coming out of um, the fab, fab lab in Barcelona, to create, upload and distribute the bits. They've created a fab market, so places where people can upload and share those designs, as Jose was talking about and even sell their creations. So it starts to create a business model around this as well. But then at the other end, you can download, download customise and make with the atoms, the materials, tools and energy. And that helps minimise the shipping of stuff all over the planet. So uh, a great metaphor I heard from my, my colleague in Barcelona was if you want to uh, make a table and get it to, from Barcelona to Cape Town, you don't send the table on a container ship, you send the design and then the fab lab in Cape Town can make it. So this is the initiative that's come out of Barcelona, uh, working to harness the capacity of these uh, this network of fab labs and, and the trend of uh, open digital fabrication to help cities become more productive again. They always used to be like this. We've lost that. We've become end users on a, on a consumer supply chain. We've also lost the knowledge and skills of how to make things. There's a prototype being developed in Barcelona in the Pobla New district um, to make this district pro um, more productive again. So it's looking at what is actually hyper-local and what can be done in that uh, one kilometre by one kilometre district. So just very quickly to finish off, uh, what they're doing there is mapping what is in that area in relation to food. Yes, it's all in Spanish. I think you can probably guess what's going on there. It's where um, composting operations are, where food's been grown. Energy, where is energy being generated locally within that district? And also fabrication. So they've got, um, you know, the fab lab there and a few other things going on. And you know, how would you actually, you know, what kind of jobs could you bring back in this situation? What kind of livelihoods could you create? So as an example of that, there's a restaurant in that district uh, called Leca, And what they did was they fabricated the fit out for this restaurant in the fab lab in Barcelona and took it down the street and assembled it on site. So that's hyper-local production. As you scale this up, you can see that it can all operate at a different level. We can still have our global supply chains, you know, where we have, have true comparative advantage instead of swapping similar goods all over the planet. But you can also do mu much of what you need at the neighbourhood level. So rather than drawing your resources from everywhere, if you want to have a circular economy, and governments are very, very hot on circular economy right now, how can you have a circular economy if you're not making things locally? So 
to, to close, cities just aren't the visible buildings and infrastructure. They are the occupied territory that they claim elsewhere. They're currently behaving in a very extractive way and they're destructive. And so we actually need to, need to start rebuilding them, the cities that we already have, not so that they don't just do less damage, but so that they become like environmental repair kits. They become biogenic or generative. And we can contribute to doing part of this, to, to doing this by enabling people to produce more of what they need locally, um, providing open access to the means of production, fostering a circular economy, making available shared design commons, and that way we can help make regenerative ecological cities. So that's the quote from uh, Thomas Dears, who is director of the Fab City Global Initiative, um, the first city to become self-sufficient. So this challenge is asking cities to produce 50% of what they need by 2054, food, energy and fabrication. The first city to become self-sufficient, simultaneously increasing employment by creating opportunities through open innovation and radically reducing carbon emissions by relocalizing production will lead the future of urban development globally. I'm doing a local iteration of this, so you can find more information about what Barcelona is doing and what people are, you know, number of people working on this stuff in Australia are doing at that uh, web address there. So thank you for your attention, and I hope that's uh, provided some good food for thought. Yeah, oh. I'm not by the way. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm introducing Anthony James. Um, Anthony is a fifth generation Australian man living with his family by the ocean in Perth. I'm very envious when I see Facebook photos. <laughs> Good surf over there. Um, on traditional uh, Noongar lands. He's an advisor, educator, writer, speaker, musician, host of the podcast. Rescope Radio, and Executive Director of the Rescope Project. Anthony works with people to create lifestyles, systems, and cultures that get to the heart of sustainability. He features in a range of media, nationally and internationally. He's a postgraduate sustainability educator at Swinburne University, and a regular speaker at conferences, festivals, and a variety of organizations. He also hosts public conversations, like this one, with prominent Australian and international guests, on regenerating the systems and stories humanity lives by. Anthony was co-editor of Everyday Transcendence, The Influence of Frank Fisher, and his writing has appeared in publications including The Conversation, The Age, World Economic Forum, Ecobusiness, Resilience, and The Footy Almanac. Please welcome Anthony James. Thanks, Jose. It would have felt too weird to introduce myself, so thanks for doing that. And, and speaking of props, there's one behind me that I neglected to mention before. This, is, uh, this event's proudly sponsored by that, uh, the, the fastest, most efficient and clean form of urban transport humanity has ever devised, which has, which has historic significance too, because when our old mate Frank was around, there would have been one at the back as well. Now, to get going, I'm going to kick this ball. I could be more conservative, but I really want to kick it into the audience and I want you to try and catch it. I don't know where it's going to go. I'll try to do it relatively straight, but I want you to catch it, all right? Oh, yes. Now, is that Cara? Hello. Hey, <laughs> haven't seen you for years. Um, can you pass it to someone else, please? You can do it any way you like. You don't have to have caught it on the floor. It doesn't matter. Pick it up. Thank you. Pass it to someone else. All right, now it's over to you to go for goal. Kick for goal. Kick for goal. <laughs> Assuming you didn't have arthritis. <laughs> okay, it's getting violent now. <laughs> Footy always ends up that way. Assuming you didn't have arthritis, where would you have tried to kick the ball? Uh, just, that, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. You've given me the perfect answer. This is the metaphor for our current economy. We'll just kick it over there somewhere. We'll, we'll go GDP, GDP, more and more stuff, consume, earn more, hope for the best, even renewable technology, and hope for the best. We'll go it on a wing and a prayer and assume 
that's going to make us better off. Instead of getting to the heart of what we started this session with, the things that you guys were reeling off is most important to us, thinking about that and aiming for that. So can you just trigger that first slide? I'll say that'll do. Thanks, Jay. We need a goal. Well, more to the point, we need to, we need to institute the goal we already sort of innately know, but we need to make that what we're aspiring to. And there are very good reasons we don't have a goal. It does fit with the economics as science, reductionistic idea of how the world works, because then you don't need a goal. You do just pummel on forwards and upwards forever on that GDP trajectory and it takes care of itself. We need to jump out of that worldview and institute a goal for the economy. Thanks, Blaine. Because what we're currently doing makes absolutely no sense. Go ahead. Thanks, James. We'll go through these pretty quick. So, And of course, what it's resulted in is this. I'll just use the ecological footprint as, as one means of demonstrating the point, but there are many and arguably more um, intricate models of how we're overshooting. But we are, we are in, I think we're at 1.7 planets now and the rest of the world's only just begun. We have to make room in countries like ours and, and we can, so I'll get onto that, but this is the consequence we're dealing with at the minute. So back to the goal. Let me just call it quality of life and quality. I'll just emphasize that point, which won't be contested. I mean, that's a broadly acceptable proposition. I'll come back to that though, because it's up to us to decide what that is. So the sorts of answers we were giving a bit earlier, uh, touch on it. Thanks, James. And this is the frame we're working with. We're currently optimizing production to maximize consumption and hope the rest takes care of itself. We need to, to paraphrase, paraphrase E.F. Schumacher, optimize consumption to maximize well-being. But optimizing, or what, if I'm gonna take off the minimalists, go for the optimalists, uh, I don't know if it'll catch as much, but optimism, who even asked the question, what are our optimal set of inputs of our consumption to get where we wanna go, a good life? Now, I'm going to whip through this very quickly, but just to demonstrate the point that some people, thankfully, have asked. And we have certain readings. I'll just touch off on energy and money. So what's our optimal energy use? Go ahead, James. I'll deal with the relativity just to demonstrate the point, mostly. That in human development index terms, the study, one study that's been done demonstrates that about a third of what the USA uses, and it's roughly comparable to Australia, around a third of that is where the optimum input is for, a, for quality living in terms of the human development. So looking at the human development indices of all the countries, that was the level of energy you required to meet that. And after that point was making no difference at all. And no additional gain, so diminishing returns pardon me, diminishing returns past only about half of that. So you're talking a fraction of our energy use is actually required to meet the end goal. Same pattern with money. So Tim Jackson in Prosperity Without Growth. These figures could be escalated now and there are studies that have gone on with it, but in the year 2000, we were talking $15,000 per person per year. Australia was 19,000 at the time, USA was about 27. That's about double now, in Australia's case a bit more. And I think the figure now we're looking at about 20, 25,000 is about our optimum GDP per capita figure, beyond which life satisfaction measures gauged in the population, they don't budge, even when GDP increases quite a lot. Thanks, Blake. And another Australian survey on this found that once incomes rise above $100,000 per year, there's a little gain in subjective wellbeing. So again, all this effort to get more than that, but it doesn't actually make any difference. So, the punchline was encapsulated by Kate Rayworth in many respects when she said that we have an economy that needs to grow, whether we, it makes us thrive, whether or not it makes us thrive. We need an economy that makes us thrive, whether or not it grows. Now that is so obvious to say, isn't it? But it's a huge challenge, thanks James, because it means, let's just say first and foremost, that big ugly dirty word that scares the pants off us, and in many respects, with justification, it's, it scares the pants off us. So for my reckoning, we're gonna need, and obviously not only mine, but I'd like to emphasize, we're gonna need better measures because we're gonna need to hang our hat on something that we can quantify and something that we feel like we're guiding the ship 
as we turn that into uncharted territory or territory that we've only come across by accident in the past and has been disastrous because we haven't planned for it, we've regarded it as awful and the whole system's hinged upon that growth. Of course, there are other ways, but we'll need to do that and track it. In a sense, set the goal and keep score. And in terms of how we determine what those measures are, but more importantly, our redefined understanding of progress and, the, and, the, and what quality of life actually will constitute, that has to be collectively determined. Oh, and that, by the way, andy.org.au, that's an example of an Australian project looking to do just that, which is worth looking up. No, just the one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll close with this. Some of you might have seen this. The Edelman Trust Barometer, major global survey, mainstream, came up with that. Only 15% of the general population in the world believe the present system is working. Systems change is going to happen by all sorts of forces, including utter discontent with what's happening right now. So we don't, we don't need to limit ourselves to more superficial responses. There is a wide open door, but we have to be constructive and positive with it, starting with what the goal is. A more convenient truth is on offer without relying on the tech fixes if we want to construct this sort of new narrative. The evidence backs us up that we can do this. So just to close, set the goal, optimise possessions to goal. You don't want to run around all day passing the ball and exhausting yourselves and getting frustrated and going nowhere. All towards whatever we determine together is worth living for. Thanks a lot. All right, now switch hats. Uh, I'd like to introduce Amanda Carl, who's sitting right next to me. Amanda's the CEO of The Next Economy. Originally trained as an anthropologist, Amanda has been working on community development projects in countries as diverse as the Philippines, Brazil and Fiji, as well as in Australia, for 23 years. After five years leading the Centre for Social Change in Brisbane, she recently established The Next Economy to support the emergence of more resilient, socially just and ecologically viable local economies across Australia and beyond. She's also a founding partner of the Zero Emissions Byron Project and is on the steering committee of the New Economy Network of Australia, which is also worth looking up. Amanda has a PhD in Human Geography from the ANU and has an adjunct position at the University of Queensland. And yes, James, sorry, I just remembered she doesn't have a PowerPoint. Please welcome Amanda Carl. I want to thank you guys because um, I was actually quite upset after Al Gore's presentation this morning. Um, and after some of the presentations from yesterday. It's been great, but I was just feeling we're missing something. It's like, yeah, the solutions that are put up, it's still like it's happening, the market's going to take care of it. And I was like, there's something really missing from that. And the previous panel was like, oh, yes, okay, we're getting into the nitty-gritty now. And then you guys coming up with some real-life examples of how this is starting to happen. And it's about question the questions underneath it around equity and justice and a collaborative economy and a different kind of economic relationship with each other and the planet. Um, it's like we keep talking about what we need to do. We, we've got the technology, okay? We've got to sort out the finance, but we actually have all the pieces there. And we've been talking about this stuff for a really long time. So why isn't it hitting the road? You know, why don't we actually have more than what we saw this morning in terms of rollout of renewable energy, um, interesting manufacturing um, solutions that are actually creating different kinds of jobs that are recirculating wealth within local economies and keeping our cities, but also our rural and regional areas vibrant. So I want to pick up on very two points as to what I'm seeing in the work that I do at a very grassroots level in regional areas where there are communities wanting to explore different kinds of economic opportunities. And on the surface, it looks like business as usual. They're looking at how do we get regional jobs? Um, what are we going to do when coal ends? Like, what's the next industry that's coming in? But what I'm finding, which is really interesting, is if you scratch the surface um, and talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, it doesn't take long for people to start asking quite radical questions. And I'm talking about really conservative national voting farmers saying, just a minute, what happened in the last 20 years? We used to be more resilient. 
We used to have co-ops here that used to look after us. We didn't have a lot of things, but we did have the basic services in town and now we don't anymore. We've got all these empty shops. You know, my kid's got a job, but the conditions are terrible. What is this all for? So there's kind of this these grumblings going on, So, but there's also a pushback against looking, actually making change happen. Now there's some power dynamics that we can all talk about, you know, corporate control and government and all that kind of stuff. But I'm seeing something much more embodied in the work that I'm doing in these communities. And it comes down to two levels. One, I want to talk about the personal, that very individual level. Um, and maybe, and why I have an issue when people say, you know, it's what the consumer chooses is going to force the markets to move and what stops individuals from choosing something different, even the most well-meaning people. And the next level up, which is a social and political level of when we come together, and I've only got five minutes um, <laughs> to talk about really complex issues. So I'm really quickly on personal like personal stuff, when people talk about change and talking about choice and who you vote for and get out there and voice, and, and seeing after the last five years of people in Australia becoming a lot more politically active and learning some skills around community organising, I'm also seeing a lot of weariness. And it's like, well, if it, is it really just up to us? And I'm trying to do everything that I can. Um, but we're still getting caught with this kind of behaviour change idea, that if everyone just changed their behaviour, everything's going to be fixed. And I, went to, I used to work with Aboriginal injecting drug users around harm minimisation and preventing blood-borne viruses. And I like to think about this in terms of drug use. So I think about smoking, okay? Um, what we do isn't just... It's not just the fact that that substance is physically addictive or they're dependent on it, and nicotine is actually physically more addictive than heroin, by the way. Um, it's If you ask a smoker why, when they've tried to give up, what was the point that they went back to smoking? It's actually not necessarily about the physical craving. It's things like, in my tea break, I used to go and hang out with my mate outside, and then when I had to give up smoking, I had to stop doing that, and then I missed out on all these important work conversations. Or actually my wife smoked, so, you know, it was a habit that we would do after dinner that we'd go outside and have a smoke and that's when we'd talk at the end of the day. There's also emotional attachments. There's identity. Your life gets built around this thing. And these are the subjective elements that we're not actually talking about. It also comes back to the belief in ourselves and how the world works that actually um, can make or break that, that change from happening. So when I was working with injecting drug users, I used to ask people if they'd given up, what was the point that they actually were able to sustain giving up over a long time? And the interesting thing was I said, one, they realised they had a choice, but the really interesting thing was in that moment when it got hard, they realised they could be different in the world. They could have different friends, they could have a different job, they could have a different life. And there were systems around them to support that from happening. So at that moment, they knew where to go for help and there was a whole structure of support to make that happen, which takes me to the next level, which is the social and political barriers to change that I'm seeing. So even if in a community you get some individuals together, they get something really non-threatening like a community gardening going. This was a question that came up in a panel yesterday. Why is it that you can actually see local councils and other people actually attacking projects, even if they don't seem to be that threatening? And what I'm seeing more and more is with all the experiments that are actually happening, even something that doesn't seem threatening actually is challenging the status quo. We're talking about changing systems here. We're talking about being different in the world and working together and doing things. So those examples that um, Jose and Sharon were talking about is actually undermining existing power relationships. And whether it's conscious or not, you're going to get pushback. So, okay, you get pushback. But what I'm seeing in Australia is for a long time we've had a system that has worked really well for a lot of people. People do expect the government to do this. And so when they're getting that pushback, there's not necessarily the skills base or the experience to know how to actually navigate that uncertainty when people are experimenting, which is what they were talking about in the previous panel. So how do we build that capacity at a local level to have different kinds of democracy in terms of decision making, in terms of how we navigate conflict and difference in communities? Um, because it's it's an unfolding process that doesn't stop. You don't just win and then that's it. This is a continual process. Um, the other thing is um, I'm doing a lot of work with leaders behind the scenes and the other interesting thing is, that, you know, everyone's kind of saying, why isn't there more leadership? And the interesting thing is when I'm meeting with people who are, on paper look really powerful, 
and yet they, behind closed doors, talk about how disempowered they feel. They don't feel like there's enough political space. They don't have enough support around them to move. They've got so many vested interests, and I think there's a lot more work to do um, with leaders, not just the ones who are official, but building different kinds of leaders in different kinds of spaces. And the last thing I want to point out, especially to a mostly Australian audience, is compared to other countries that I've worked in, a big barrier I'm seeing is talking about inequality. Um, we've got this really strong cultural thing around egalitarianism and that everyone is equal and everyone has the same opportunity. But in doing that, you're actually we're reinforcing that idea of the individual. Everyone can just make it on their own. And it's actually undermining the idea that we do need structures and systems and processes to, to come back to, and we are in, interdependent as well. So in terms of moving forward, what I'm seeing that is working in communities that are getting on with the job of making the next economy is that they create safe spaces for experimentation where they can try and fail but also, more importantly, where they can learn to be together differently. We can actually learn those skills around democracy. The only way to do it is by doing it. How do we learn to let go of some of the independence? And I'm guilty of this. You know, it's safer to have a really stable income in your own house and not have to be dependent on anyone. It's scary to learn interdependence and to learn that trust again. And Finally, I just um, also just want to highlight the need to really come back to and bring to the fore the questions of equity and justice and the role of systems and structures. Um, because it, we can't do it on our own, and I'm seeing some really great projects that keep getting squashed or just run out of steam because they're not actually hooked into the systems that are actually going to maintain it. To do that is going to be difficult because you've got to create new spaces within those systems. But we do need those systems around to encourage, to facilitate, to enable, to push, and to accelerate the changes that we want to see. We, we're in a really interesting time where we can support these experiments and actually help develop a completely different kind of economic systems and practices. Not one system, many systems. It could be fairer, it could be regenerative, or we could end up with something that is more unequal where there's actually less distribution of resources and the power is concentrated in too fewer hands. But I'm inspired by this work because this is the sort of thing that's going to get us there. Thank you. All right, so the rest of our time is to have a chat. Uh, the dialogue in the session we ran yesterday was terrific, so I, I'm really happy if you guys have come here today and filled the room so we can um, effectively go on with that. Um, Amanda talked about some of that chat we had yesterday, and there's some people in the room I know who were there too. But uh, we have two mics there, so please feel free to make your way to those mics if you'd like to ask a question of our panel. And I'd like, also like to do what I did yesterday and invite the panel to ask questions questions or seek to draw out anything else that came out of those fire starters. Um, I'll, I'll get us started if you like, but then let's proceed from there. Um, to the panel in general, I'm interested in, is, is there a sense of um, narrative that's common to the experiments and the, um, and the workshopping that you guys have done in places around the country, around the world? Is there a sense of new narrative emerging out of that, a new idea of progress? emerging out of that that you would comment to? No, everyone's looking at me. <laughs> um, all right. Um, well, yeah, all right. Look, uh, I think that, um, I think that the value of diversity, I came from a, I did a conference in um, Columbia a few weeks ago, and it was uh, called the Global Assembly for Knowledge Democracy. And one of the key ideas is that um, this ecology of knowledges, that we, we, don't, we can't just rely on one knowledge, one way of thinking, or one knowledge system. We actually need a whole number of interacting diversity of ways of thinking. And I think that, I think that that's what I would say to that. I would say that, um, that we're essentially pluralizing our way, the way in which we consider um, what it means to I don't know. These metaphors are really fraught. Advance, progress. They're kind of old words, right? So we're, we're, sort of, we're sort of searching for new words that can move us past essentially, um, essentially that, uh, that, 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 that old paradigm. But, but I think something that, in, that includes diversity uh, 
Um, and that because diversity builds resilience, it builds resilience at multiple levels. So that's what I would say, yeah. You guys? Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think the, the big thing, the terms that are coming out in a lot of the discussions in the new economy network at the moment is around collective and collaborative forms of engagement and practices. I'd like to see more robust discussions about what that is. Sometimes it seems simple and straightforward and kind of romanticise this idea of get back to community and connectedness. It's really hard. Let's actually be honest about that. Um, and, say, and, and to be able to deal with the uncertainty and to deal with the differences in that, how do we develop those skills? How can we let it be okay that it's a bit scary to take that, that step? That's, um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I, we might get back to that. Thanks, Herman. Go ahead. Um, so I've been chatting with Anthony earlier today about this already, and um, I'm, I'm on, of the opinion that lack of time is a big contributor for society to move away from a consumer you know, consumer-based society to a more productive or even an ecologically sustainable society. And um, I was wondering what do you think um, is the likelihood that we're going to see a shift in the economy to everybody working part-time at, you know, at the same time so that there can be no discrimination between, oh, you are lucky to work part-time and you have to work full-time. What about everybody works yeah. half the time and then we don't have a net loss in, you know, yeah. productivity in that sense? This is one of my big, um, big bugbears. Um, my day job is in state government. Uh, so I've been doing what I would call a double shift for a long time, and I'm sure that relates to many of you here too. You've got a foot in. You're either poor and you're doing the work you like to do, or you have money and things drive you out the wall. So there's a whole bunch of people working all around the world right now on cracking this nut, because if we can... It's called the values crisis. There's a really cool report, um, I've forgotten who's produced it, but it was the Commons Transition Coalition, uh, Michelle Bowens. If you Google that, you should find it. The values crisis is about, you know, there's people and a lot of citizen innovators creating a massive amount of value, but they can't convert that value into being able to pay the rent, for example. So this ties us all into, you know, having to go on and have a, a job to make money to pay for those expenses. So, yeah, it's... it's uh, it's stressful, um, it's burning us out, it's taking meaning away from us unless you're lucky to have a really meaningful job. Um, and more and more people are trying to do the work that they choose. So this is the, the peer production that Jose was talking about. So people now with digital technology can come together, form something that they are passionate about and work on it. One example I'd just like to use that's not quite related to sustainability, um, I set up a Facebook page back in 2010 called Lost Dogs of Adelaide. And this just grew very slowly. I handed it on to someone else because I was doing other things and couldn't couldn't do it justice. But a whole group of people, volunteers, built this. It's now a page that's followed by 60,000 people and it essentially operates as a public service provided by citizens for citizens. You know, if, if government was trying to do that, there'd still be arguments over branding and, you know... Um, do dogs recognise council boundaries and all sorts of strange <laughs> things? So, but I actually, it would be, it would be, um, who's going to fund it, you know? Um, but this is now working, so vets, animal shelters, you know, um, the council are using this service as well. People who lose a dog are finding they can get that dog recovered because it's like the big virtual stoby pole of where you put your notice about where you've lost or found a dog and not having to pay a pound fee. So that's helpful to people as well. So they're self-organised, but what they haven't done is worked out well, how they've, they've set up as a charity, but they haven't worked out how can we actually capture some of the value, to even pay our internet bills. So one of the, the things I think is going to be really valuable, you know, universal basic income is another idea that's been kicked around. There's a lot of um, nuances to that pros and cons, but we certainly have to look, if we're going to look at wellbeing, working out how we can renegoti renegotiate the social contract around work and perhaps breaking that nexus between income and work and what is actually work. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of work that's being done out there right now that's not valued in any way or, or isn't able to be converted into what you need to access in a market. So, yes, please bring it on. <laughs> Yeah, time pressures are huge. Yeah, and I'll just just add a bit. I mean, how much money is going into uh, property speculation and to people who've been doing property speculation? You know, like it's ridiculous. When are we? You know, if we if we wanted to have a part time job, it's a wonderful, like great. I think we should all live with tw at twenty hours a week max. 
but we're not going to be able to pay the current amount that is being asked for rent or let alone for mortgage. So we've constructed, there's su such bad structural impediments to actually creating that. So we have to, we actually have to work um, at that policy level and at the, at the social contract level that actually creates this outcome. You know, one of the things I learned in, in Berlin was that, you know, you can live cheap and people can uh, live a public life. They can live a life where they're engaged if they want to because they're not constantly putting time and energy into that sort of thing. So, Yeah, yeah thanks, everyone. Thanks for that so far, guys. I'd like to add a couple of thoughts too. Um, I was talking to a colleague this morning on the way in suggesting that well, not suggesting, it's again old news in a sense, but it's remarkable the extent to which our society operates as a giant make work scheme. Mm. We talk about jobs like we've got to create jobs without thinking about, again, what it's for. So it's a strange way to do it. Instead of looking at the work that needs doing and then thinking how we can construct the value systems around that. Um, and there has been work done to this, again, to that extent around optimum levels of work hours. Great economists that we've that we've constructed the system on even said at some point you will be able to reduce your work hours to about what Jose was talking about. They forecast we would do that. We would reap the rewards of automation and other things that release us from the bonds of necessary labour and get to be creative and intellectual, as was mentioned in, in a in the plenary just before. So it is something that's available to us, but yes, it takes changing the structures and changing the norms around that. I said to Herman before how good it will be when his four day a week job becomes a badge of honour as opposed to in his industry still still a bit of, oh, you're, you're a little soft going four days. In other spaces, that's not quite so. The taboos are shifting, and that's certainly important, I think. And I, I'm attracted, too, to what Amanda said earlier around acknowledging the scariness of that space in terms of what we can do as individuals to opt out of those systems and structures to try and create or bridge to the next. Uh, in some cases, of course, communities are forced into that, and that was yesterday's panel and a couple of people here. In other cases where we're not, can we leap into that space? Can we take courage from each other, set up systems and structures that can harness it as much as possible, and then create lifestyles that create space for us to not need those conventional salaries and, and live in a way that creates the time space that you're referring to, Herman, to make more of this stuff happen? I just want to say something really quickly. Um, I've really enjoyed Deborah Roberts from Durban's contributions and because um, I've done a lot of work in, in different countries. And one thing I always come back to around this is something they said before about the affordable cities is that, you know, we have to do this work to afford it. But 80% of the world, this is a 2014 statistic, 80% of the world lives on less than $10 a day. That doesn't necessarily mean that those 80 those 80% of the world are living completely poverty-ridden lives. Um, but they are tapped into very different economic practices to meet their daily needs. Um, so they will be relying more on family networks and subsistence production, um, informal economic practices, volunteer labour. Like there's a whole lot of things going on in that that even if you, and this goes back to Kathy Gibson's work who was on the panel before, even in Australia, if you actually look at, break down somebody's lifestyle, where do you get all the goods and services that you need? We actually do draw on a lot of different things that aren't just from our income, but we've kind of almost taken on this narrative that I have to be self-reliant, there is no one else I can rely on, I have to have a job, which has been aided by increasingly services and that safety net being eroded over time which actually feeds into that insecurity that now I have to make more money at the same time, time as families have been breaking apart. And you don't have as many people to call on if you need to raise, you know, $1,000 in 48 hours. So it's kind of that those social networks and social and economic practices, we are still tapped into them. They still are there, but they're made to be invisible. And I think it's a political project to make them visible and say, actually, we do rely on multiple economic practices here. It's not just... Um, a standard nine to five job because actually a lot of people don't even have that anymore if you look at it. So. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your panel presentation. Um, so I work in government in the United States, and I'm lucky enough to be working on a project right now called Green Zones Initiative. And uh, we are just getting started in launching one of our community green zones. And I really love the idea of integrating the circular economy into that conversation of how we create a specific action plan that we have some funding for. Um, and I'm wondering, as we engage the community and develop Developing this action plan, um, which will hopefully be a very community-driven process, um, how to bring this conversation to them. I've, I, I feel that there is sort of some gut level understanding of people and the people in this community may already have it, but our languages may be different. Um, so if you have any recommendations of how to approach this conversation from sort of that bureaucratic policy wonky side um, with the community members and, um, and moving forward with a collective vision on how the city can help the community develop that, uh, that local economy. Yeah, there's a couple of resources. So the first one is um, a book that um, Darren Sharp is just in the f second row here, and Sharon Eid, and um, maybe someone else here. It's um, what's it called? It's uh, Shareable Cities, right? Sharing Do you want to talk about that really quick? Shareable Cities. The, the, okay. Yeah. So it's a uh, it's a book being pulled together by Shareable out of the U.S. Um, and a whole bunch of us all around the world have contributed research into, you know, case studies about what is going on in cities, so actual practices, but also policy measures to get certain things happening. So there's a whole bunch of different chapters around, I don't know, water, um, waste, governance, different, yeah, transport, all the usual kinds of things. So that's coming out in August, so do look out for that. Um, how to talk to people about circular economy, we've been having this kind of debate um, where I'm from because... How, how are we going to get people interested? It's kind of a policy boffin thing, you know. So how do you make it tangible and real? One of the things I'm hoping that we might have in our, um, you know, a, a makerspace that we're hoping to get set up, a community-based one in our state soon, is uh, a precious plastics machine, which is a bit of an example of, of this stuff. So it's an open source design sitting on the internet. They're taking it, they're making them in Barcelona, they're making them in Bali, I think China, just the other day I saw a post. And what these things do is they, they granulate down plastic, then melt it, extrude it, and that becomes a filament for 3D printer ink. So that's circular economy at a very, very micro level. So I think if you can have tangible things, get people involved in mapping. I think map jams, which is another thing Sherable have been doing, actually crowdsourcing information on what people know. If you remember the, the presentation I had from Barcelona where they got people involved in what's in our community around food, energy and fabrication. So what does a circular economy need to be made of? And then get people involved in identifying that because people like to be asked for their input and their advice and their expertise and that's a good way of involving people in a practical exercise that will then draw out all that information for you to kind of say, here's what we've already got. It's an asset map of what we've already got. What else might we need to become truly circular? So that's probably a good conversation starter. I just made that up. So. No, that's, that's actually what I do with people. Um, okay. And just from a, you said, government perspective, um, being able to do that online and show it visually, great but you can't replace the face-to-face -face conversations and bringing people together into the room where they learn from each other because that's building community, but it's building a different sense of who we are. Like the number of communities say, oh, we don't have any community here. We're all just selfish and blah, blah, blah. It's like, really? Is that really what's going on? So what happened when that cyclone came through? Or you know, ca capturing the stories of when people have worked together too, they start to think of themselves and each other differently, and that's the trust-building piece. So it's the combination of the visual, the online, and the face-to-face -face around that. Oh, and movement generation. Uh, guys, I think they're based in Oakland, California. They do some really awesome work in working with communities around, around that issue. So check them out. And I'll just quickly add that last year um, we we produced um, the City is Commons, a policy reader. So about half the people in this room actually wrote sections for that, <laughs> um, including Anthony, Sharon, Darren, um, Josh, and anyone else I've missed. <laughs> so, um, so that's a really useful, um, short, a little rough, but um, short um, resource that we'll be updating. So the city is commons, a policy reader. Very much connected with a plenary conversation around urban comedy. Oh, and Take Back the Economy, which um, Stephen Healy was part of as well. That book. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, this has been really fascinating. Uh, I'm from Brazil, from Rio. Um, I just had a couple of reflections, I think mainly for Sharon and Jose, but 
I mean, I think it speaks to everyone, um, which I'd like just to hear any reflections. One of the things that occurred to me when I heard uh, about the Fab Labs was about the story of fidget spinners, you know, those little plastic things, because I heard a segment on a radio saying that the guy who says he developed this, he put it on YouTube when he did it for his own use, uh, his own distraction, put it on YouTube, and then in, you know, at some point, uh, somebody figured out that they could make a lot of money, and you know, it became a world trend. And it's it's not owned by anyone, so it's being produced all over the place, but mainly in China. And so I just wondered if there is a risk uh, that that some of the Fab Lab uh, concepts could be misappropriated or misused in a way that's actually going to increase pollution. I was also wondering if there's an impact on local pollution from from bringing production back locally if there's any, uh, you know, uh, attempt to mitigate that in the process of designing these. Um, and then on the positive, I mean, just thinking about scaling by example, which is what you're, this is talking about. So it's the idea of, uh, so businesses, you know, they, they are competitive by nature or supposed to be, and then they, there's the idea of, of uh, intellectual property rights and all that. And this, this actually, in a way, I think, uh, the Fab Lab concept seems to me like it would expand potentially uh, dramatically quickly because of the fact that it's decentralized, um, it it's, can scale by example, and also it doesn't have to, I mean, I'm assuming producers at the very individual local level don't necessarily have to go through any sort of bureaucracy to production. So I'm wondering about the scaling potential, and it seems to me it would be pretty dramatic uh, based on kind of the low barriers in that sense. I'm just curious about that. Um, um, I guess first of all, with the you know, if you relocalise production, you would want it to be clean. You can't bring production back into a city and have it at a very granular granular level all throughout the city and have the same kind of industry we've had in nineteenth and twentieth century. So you, it would it would have to be clean green production. I think that that's the intention behind this. Whether there is a question around, you know, um, these spaces are for people to come in and play and tinker, you know, maybe making fidget spinners is a kind of a gateway drug to making, I don't know. But we, <laughs> we, we do need to think about, are we just actually replicating? So this is the thing, you can relocalise production, but the systems that sit underneath that about how you do that and ownership and governance, all that sort of stuff is important as well. And so you don't want to set up a situation where you're just becoming another little a factory for consumption and bringing stuff in from somewhere else and making stuff that's used and then thrown away. So, you know, there's that's the, what the Fab City Initiative is actually about, is saying, okay, we've got all this making skills and capacity here, how about we turn it to, to social purpose? And the other big um, uh, project to, to look at social purpose of these spaces is it's the Global Humanitarian Lab. Um, so the idea that you can actually harness all these skills for deployment in disaster zones. Mm. So you would take, you could actually produce parts in a disaster area that people need rather than shipping them all the way from another country at a great you know, time delay and cost. So all those things do need to be considered. Um, and in terms of, you know, if someone puts something on YouTube, I guess it's kind of, you know, um, open slather if people want to take that idea up and it's become a meme, really, fidget spinners. So... But in terms of if people produce something, there's been a lot of questions around this. Uh, whether so, how do you how do you keep knowledge produced by a community available to that community, but without it being appropriated by corporations or people that you know want to do that? So there's a whole bunch of work going into what's it called Commons based production reciprocity licenses. Commons based reciprocity licenses. So this is the peer to peer foundation. So if you look this stuff up, they're trying to basically work out how. You don't have to lock something down with IP. You can keep it open, but you know the people that aren't actually putting that contribution in, but wanting to come in and take that knowledge for their own benefit and actually extract and externalise that value are prevented from doing so, or they actually have to contribute something back into the system. So, any lawyers out there, you can have a, a great time with that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it's it's fundamentally a cultural thing. Um, Culture is fundamental. So if we take a libertarian approach to this model, it'll just be a total disaster. You know, you'll get lots of people 3D printing their own weapons, guns, improvised explosive devices, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's a free for all. I actually think social model and culture is just totally fundamental that we have to, and, and I, that's where I think the maker movement actually has a big role to play because my experience of the maker movement is that people are very conscious. You know, when I built some garden beds at the Footscray Maker Lab, 
um, I was scolded for leaving off cuts. There weren't a lot of off cuts. You know, there were just a few off cuts from my point of view. It's like, hey, you know, easy, easy does it. But no, I didn't take the resources and, and turn those resources into for use with those resources. You know, so the, so the way people were thinking there was actually very strongly aligned with, um, you know, with those principles that we're talking about. So, so I think if, 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 if the model gets corporatized and built into, you know, the uh, industrial growth machine, then total disaster. Um, if, the, if the model comes from the maker movement and gets built around principles of resilience and sustainability, et cetera, et cetera, then, then it's going to make a difference. So I really think, I really think yeah, there has to be a strong coupling across those uh, domains. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a really thought-provoking panel. Uh, there's a lot of uh, questions that I'd like to ask, but I'll limit myself to one. Uh, I think that the, the maker labs are one of these opportunities where communities uh, can start to sort of re-engage and re-establish uh, these alternative economies. Uh, an example I'm a little more familiar with is around the community energy sector. And I suppose we saw this morning in Al Gore's presentation some examples of how can uh, you know solar power and batteries are leapfrogging some of the you know the the really uh, industrial and and centralised systems of energy, but what we also saw is that there's this tipping point of parity, where where there's there is a market logic that's waiting for a, a price point beyond which uh, you know these assets as he described it which are frozen up are going to start to flow. And I guess I'd be really interested in your thoughts about what this flow, what this flood, uh, has the potential to do to the, the almost fragile space that's just uh, emerging now for communities to, you know, to begin establishing this space. And you know, in regard to energy or, or any example, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah. Wow. Can I have a quick question? Have a, yeah, yeah um, that really hit me at the community energy. Um, Congress that was had earlier in the year, there was like a room full of amazing people from communities setting up their own community-owned renewable projects. And they asked a question to the audience, audience participation, the question, they did a poll that went up on the screen. And the question was, uh, what would facilitate or enable a lot more community energy projects? And everyone went on about, like, everyone, because there had been a presentation earlier in the day, and everyone said, oh, consistency in federal policy and, and, and support. And I was sitting next to um, the woman who set up Nova, which is the first community-owned retailing energy um, dis in company in Australia. And we looked at each other and went, no, because as soon as there's consistency, as soon as the government gets its house in order around renewable energy, that's what the companies are waiting for and they're going to jump in because it makes it more feasible for them to get involved. So it, it's that's the irony of the space we're working in. And, and that's the – when I'm working with communities, especially – that are doing it tough, there's more space for innovation and experimentation because they don't have any other choice. They feel kind of abandoned and they have to get on with it. So there's more space to actually try. Um, there's also a point at which crisis hits in and then that space shuts down again. So the question is how do we open up spaces before it gets bad and how do we protect? I don't know. I don't have any answers around this, but how do we set up systems to sort of protect those things? If we're talking about democratisation of ownership of access of equity it's a very different thing i used the example yesterday you know we could get to 100 percent renewable energy really quickly agl has you know is doing all this massive investment in renewable energy they're advertising it it's great we need that to happen but they also have a stated goal of controlling 80 percent of australia's electricity market and i'm like whoa what sort of economy do we want what sort of energy do we want our energy system was built with public you know public infrastructure which has protected us, it's, that's the debates that we need to have around the economy and the relationships we're setting up. Yeah, I'd like to underline that. almost don't need to add anything. But just a, um, one little comment to emphasise the questions of what, what do we want in the big picture. And that is to say that, I guess I said it in my presentation, but a lot of the stuff we're working at sort of implicitly still seems to operate out of let's find ways to replace our bad old dirty ugly conglomerate stuff with good, clean, community, local stuff. 
still with the mindset of keeping going society basically as it is otherwise. Um, and that's, that's sort of flawed in a range of ways, and I think, Amanda, you've, you've hit off on some really important aspects. So, yes, the, and, and I had never quite thought of it in that way of, of that little opening that, that we are presented with at the moment to actually be really conscious of uh, keeping. And, um, and, and even in that sense, the good stuff we're doing to, be, to keep the mind around that, like keep that broader perspective and not get on the good ship and just barrel on, that would be sort of replicating the mindset that we're currently on. If I, if I can contradict myself for a moment too, though. Um, the, other, the other flip side of this is this is hard work and there's a part of me that's like, I actually want a system, like I don't want to have to do all my own energy, look after my own water, all my own food, all the governance systems, go to a million meetings so that we can make decisions about everything. I've done that. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's what, so the question is what do we need to be held with a public system, whatever the governance system is, and I think it's changing, but we need to have that discussion about government as well, which is happening. Um, what needs to be held there? What can be held locally? You know, and it, it's messy. Like they said, I just loved it this, this before when they were saying, it's messy, we don't know what's going to come out of this. But how do we develop the skills to deal with that uncertainty and, and move forward regardless? And, and we'll see what comes out of it. I think this is the time we're going to set, look back on in 20 or 30 years' time and go, that's when things changed and the system kind of shifted a little bit. But we don't know yet. And even well, the I don't know. <laughs> Maybe even you do. the fact that Amanda just openly contradicted herself <laughs> is, is sort of what I'm talking about, to have the space and the wherewithal and the consciousness to be able to do that so that you, you're really covering off on the broader things we need to cover off on. Um, any other comments? Yeah. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm very supportive of localization as a, as a concept, um, but I'm just trying to think through the realities in, in the context of you know, a relentlessly globalizing economy, uh, um, as I see it, a market capitalist economy that has a, a globalizing logic. Um, so, and, and I was thinking through Jose's um, design uh, example, and you know, one of the, the things I was thinking is, well, people who get design, you know, it could be a design commons, but then businesses competing in the market probably find that they might have to source things globally because that's where it can be gotten cheapest. I mean, there's a reason why we've globalised is because businesses have, have taken advantage of economies of scale, of divisions of labour, and I don't know, quite understand how it works, but they're not stupid they've found that they can reduce costs by doing it that way. And so how do you localise an economy in this context? Thanks. Yeah. Good question. No, I think what you're talking about is a fundamental challenge and contradiction. I don't really have a, uh, like a satisfactory, you know, in the box answer. Um, it's a lot like what, you know, we're talking about here. This is a messy space. And a lot of these things are emerging. I don't think that, I mean, that's why I sort of prefaced everything by saying this is an emerging issue. You know, there's a few examples here that show the potential for what might become at the same time. And also the example of um, the Fab Lab Barcelona um, is, a, is, a, is a bigger example. But at the same time, we don't have an answer to how um, economies of scale um, produce goods for mass markets because you know, we're, we're all completely wedded to those mass markets, and we're also wedded to the economies of scale that are produced through them, and we're wedded to the externalities that they produce and all the other dynamics and entailments that are part of that. So um, sidestepping that economic logic, I think, is, I think, it, it, I mean, instead of going abstract, what I would do is go case by case and look at the different examples and say, well, why did this group of people decide to, instead of go retail, mainstream, we're going to get this kind of farm equipment, they said, well, we're better off working together and building our own stuff, right? Because then we can learn from that community and we can, we can say, okay, well, that's why they made that decision. Because the mass market was not producing the things that they needed to do organic farming the way they wanted to do it. Or with AbilityMate, you could take a step back and say, why, why aren't they just buying mass-produced assistive devices from the big you know, companies, pharmaceuticals, whoever, 
instead of trying to 3D print it themselves. Well, in the case of AbilityMate, the costs are really, really high for assistive devices. There's long supply chains and um, lots of regulation. So there's huge, huge cost benefits and two consumer benefits of actually going from design to 3D print. Now, there's lots of other things involved there that's, that's, that's more complicated to, to do that new model, but still. So I think, I, think, I think, you know, it's kind of like both and. You're right, you know, this is a big systems, and who wants to produce their own Mac computer, right? You know, um, we just buy it from a, uh, from, a, um, uh, from a store, and the Foxconn slaves in China produce it for us, right? Um, at, on the other hand, there are other uh, examples where we can begin to learn where you can begin to be creative and sidestep that. So does that help? Yeah. 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 Um, there's a couple of things that come to my mind too around um, principally the place of technology and material in our well-being. So just coming back to where we started again, I was just thinking as you were talking, Jose, and this, some of the stuff that we've um, sort of refers to what Johnny was saying, that the, the terms that were reeled off when we started, um, they're almost the answer. I mean, not a clean answer. It is very much, you know, it's, it's all this. But they're the fundamental, I suppose, to guide us in the sense that there's, there's only a certain, I guess in a sense, there's only a certain degree of economies of scale we need. Like if we're going on the basis that a certain threshold of material and money and energy and whatever is, is what we need for a good life, then it releases you from the compelling narrative of that economies of scale um, thing. And you can, you'll joyfully take on some extra personal labour that's unpaid, for example, in community gardening or making or family. Um, or your sense of calm or whatever that terrific answer over there was. So, yeah, I guess that's just to paint that, that um, put that colour back in the mix of the picture that we're talking about, which is also all true. Thank you. Hi. Um, I do a lot of work with community-driven projects, mostly in the Pacific, and uh, I think it's a really great approach and I've really loved what you guys have been discussing, but I'm just wondering what support there is within those um, ideas and systems for resource poor countries. So countries that do need to do things from a community driven level, but they can access the designs possibly if they have internet, but then how do they get the actual materials to implement those designs? There are fab labs all over the world, including in India, including in Latin America. Um, one of the, the main ethos of these, and I'm not talk, just talking about fab labs or other maker spaces, but one of the main ethos of these spaces is giving people the means to solve their own problems locally with available technology. Um, they don't have to have every you know bit of kit at their disposal to do really innovative things, and I think you could probably safely say that there's a lot of epic hackers in African communities with some of the stuff I've seen you know, their ability to produce, and they will because of, you know, no woodcuts in, off, off cuts in Africa, Jose. So, you know, everything's used. So I think there's examples there. You know, you look at somewhere like Cuba that was completely shut off for a long time and had to become very um, innovative around how it produced its food and uh, there's great videos online about how you can look at their, their fixer culture in that country. Um, but in terms of the other stuff, I guess you might be better placed to communities. Yeah, I mean, I actually, Michelle Bowen, who's been mentioned a few times, the first time I met him, that's what I said to him. I said, yeah, but that's not going to work in a lot of the places that I that I work in. And he, he just reminded me of that. He said, well, actually, what if it's, look, everyone has a mobile phone now. And actually, I learned to text in the Philippines. I hadn't owned a mobile phone before I was living in the Philippines, way beyond uh, where we're at with coverage and things like that. And he said, you know, if it is as simple as having access to a mobile phone, the internet, there's decentralised energy systems, which I saw more of in India than I'd ever seen solar panels in, um, than in Australia in 2010. And I went, ah, oh, okay, if it's simple and it, and people do have access to that, there is potential there. Um, but he said, you know, it, again, this comes back to questions of equity and access and, yeah, so... Yeah. I, I like hearing stories that um, Sharon just said about places like Africa and India. It's like I think it can free people up. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think I think there's like a um, almost like a uh, kit model emerging. So a guy came into the Footscray Maker Lab a couple of years ago. 
His name's Rex Hazard, and he was doing um, basically disaster relief work in the Philippines and other places. And your mate Andrew does yeah. that too. Yeah. Oh yeah. What's his last name? Andrew Lamb. So Andrew Lamb. Andrew Lamb. Yeah, Engineers Without Borders. Yeah. Engineers Without Borders. So basically doing like um, sort of like disaster relief out of the box uh, approaches. So in Nepal, basically helping with the post-earthquake um, sort of um, crises, damages. So essentially using all the tools available that would be within a sort of um, makerspace or fab lab to essentially um, support people in sort of getting their stuff together. Um, so and I do think there's a whole sort of um, model around that that, I, you know, I, I don't know the exact model, but I think it has to do with the knowledge, the technology, the resources. You've got to have sort of a kind of almost like a, um, a starter, a starter pack. Um, and that starter pack can, can be quite enabling in those particular situations. Um, yeah. That'll be our last question. Thanks. Okay. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for the being on this panel because this is very, um, it's been very inspiring to know what has actually been done and to know to point out so many resources for learning more about it. Um, democratizing knowledge is a very like deep interest of mine. Um, but I'm also wondering, uh, because I see that in order for this to really make, so it, it, it for it to make an impact to it on a global scale, it would have to be, you would have to have um, sort of changes to economic models all over the world. And I'm wondering, if that happens, um, or as it is happening, what do you think is the role of the private sector, uh, if they have any role, or like in terms of both firms and corporations of all sizes, and um, especially in the knowledge economy models, so like consultants and uh, universities, as well as manufacturing? Uh, that would be my question, yeah, thank you. I guess the thing that I've paid most attention to is a model that, again, has been talked about a lot by Michelle Bounds. We've been uh, listening to him quite a bit, which is about the, the core of value creation now is, is in communities, is in this peer production. Um, and where that value is being created, you can actually have what um, they, he would call an entrepreneurial, ethical entrepreneurial coalition. So you can actually build businesses on top of these commons, different kinds of businesses perhaps than what we're used to seeing. Uh, and that there's a kind of guardian angel, like a foundation that would sort of look after the, the governance and the infrastructure of that. One of the examples that he points, points to is in Spiral. They're based in New Zealand. Um, not just software type stuff. There's also AbilityMate, I believe, is now part of the Inspiral network. So look up in Spiral. I'm not sure if they're, I think they're a .com, .org. Um, yeah, so there's there's the, the potential to build value on top of commons. I mean, if you look at the example of the US, the, the US well, Linux, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, so, okay, well, even the US government, when they made they make data available, like weather, you know, ge geography, geology, and then people build apps on top of it. So they build value on top of it. They can build businesses on top of it. So there is still the potential to do that. I guess uh, it would be a different kind of economy in terms of the type of private sector that we have. Just because you can have a market economy, it doesn't have to be, you know, a neoliberal capitalist market. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Go yeah, I guess the, the difference, going back to the previous question as well, is what we have now that we haven't had before, I guess the, the crux of it is the democratisation of access to things that would have been captured by a private corporation, um, whether it was knowledge or capital or equipment. Um, or design or the people who can do that has been enclosed. Mm. Whereas now we've got a, a situation where it's becoming a commons, it's more open and so people can access it. So it opens up different possibilities for how we organise economically around that. So that's that's the interesting thing around power dynamics, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the only thing I'd add is just, uh, again, Michelle, Michelle Bowens, he's here like a ghost, um, <laughs> uh, distinction of uh, extractive versus generative logic. So if you have a um, system where essentially like Linux, you know, Linux developed as an open source process, um, and then lots of different uh, enterprises got into the game as service providers, you know, IBM, for example. Big, big, big cap. So he would he would say, well, that's that's capitalism, and essentially taking a um, parasitic role towards people's commoning efforts. 
So, so that's the essential contradiction that's emerged within the open source movement and, uh, and the market. So his question is, how do you actually find a way in which the value of the open sourcing is endogenized, is kept within um, those communities that are producing that value and, and, and can maintain that value for others. And so, so then there are experimental ideas like commons-based reciprocity licenses or copyleft mm -hmm. so that um, if an enterprise wants to use a design um, but they're not giving back, then they have to pay something. But if another enterprise which is, you know, which is giving wants to use it, they can use it. So there's a way in which um, the commons strengthens itself. Yeah, I don't know if I put that forward incredibly clear, but yeah. <laughs> well, that's our closing word, hasn't it? <laughs> No, no, it was really very good. Thanks very much, everyone. I, I want to actually issue a couple of invites. Um, to join us at the New Economy Network of Australia, which you heard mentioned a couple of, in fact, we're all involved, neweconomy.org.au. There's a conference coming up in September which will formalise that network, so it's a new and emerging thing. Um, and I'd also like to invite you to contribute, if you'd like, to the field guide that the Rescope Project's producing, also just started. But that's where we want to highlight the regenerating efforts on the ground to systems and stories. So if you've got anything in mind that you'd like to communicate more, we can help you do it. Um, and also tomorrow, our, our colleague, our uh, Energy Systems and Society fellow, Josh Floyd, will be on a panel with um, David Holmgren and Sam Alexander and Kate Dundas on retrofitting the suburbs. That's at one o'clock tomorrow. Um, and finally, an invitation to speak to us. We're up the back there, sign up forms there. Um, you can subscribe to Rescope Radio, the podcast channel, and uh, and you can donate too. Um, now stick around to chat if you like. There's nothing coming after us. We might see you at the Melbourne Conversation, wherever that is. We'll have to find out where that is this evening, Town Hall, this evening. And uh, please also thank, on your, on your way out, uh, Lisa Guy and Jacob Fair for filming, Sarah McConnell, our illustrator, and Devin illustrating over there. I'm really looking forward to what they've come up with. Everyone who's made the summit happen, you for being here <coughs> and for such great questions, and above all, the panel. Please thank the panel. Thanks.